Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. So typically I'll wax poetic about some early 1970s song, and then, of course, lyrics from the song become the title for our show. But Danny said, you know, you're doing a lot of 70s music. Maybe come up with something different. By the way... You are listening to the On The Tape Podcast. I am Guy Adami, always joined by Dan Nathan and Danny Moses. I had crushes back in the day. Obviously, I'm married now, so I'm not prone to such. But one of my early crushes was that of Bridget Fonda of the Fonda family fame. You may recall her in Single White Female. You may recall her, obviously, in Godfather 3, a movie I typically don't mention, but she was in it. But the Bridget Fonda movie that I want to talk about here, because it's going to lend itself to the title of this episode, Danny Moses, is Point of No Return, 1993, her with Gabriel Byrne. It was sort of a remake of La Femme Nikita. She played this agent. She was an assassin. She was a badass, and she looked really good. But I mentioned Point of No Return, Danny, because in a lot of ways, the exorcised Danny Moses feels like we're at the point of no return. By the way, before we get to the exercise aforementioned Danny Moses, you asked for it and you got it. The always perma bear, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, will be joined in just a few minutes by Tom Lee. Tom Lee of Funstrat. You know him, you want him, you got him, and we'll be chatting with him in just a few brief minutes. So with that said, we are at this point of no return, Danny Moses. We are. And I want to say that I've always said, if you have a differing opinion than someone and they're bullish and you're bearish, whether it's on the market or individual securities, you should hear them out on both sides. So I'm looking forward to that. I was thinking about an album from 1977 by the great Bob Marley called Exodus, which is, I think we should all leave this market, but, and we're the three little birds here. And I want to, you know, change the words from don't worry about a thing to I would be worrying about everything at this point. <laughs> so I think I think we've seen various sectors and themes in subprime auto and that we had a shutdown of American Car Center on Friday night because they couldn't get a securitization done. We've seen some good earnings and some bad earnings here and so forth. But I feel like we're kind of settling in here. And that's not necessarily a good thing to fundamentals, again, taking over everything else. And I want to say one thing, which has gotten absolutely no press, funny enough, and I'm sure it'll come out in the following days here, but Jerome Powell is doing his semi-annual testimony in front of the Senate on the 7th of March at 10 a.m. next week. And I haven't seen one note written about that. And yes, the next Fed meetings, not until March 22nd, but rest assured, you're going to get some information. And I'll just finish this little part by saying, I can't imagine anything really dovish that he could say that's happened here in the last couple weeks since the last Fed meeting. But anyway, I'm not feeling very bullish at all. So I look forward to talking to Tom later about that. Yeah. So Tom is a guy that we've known for a long time. And listen, I think he is a really data driven strategist. I think he often digs in as we dig in. We oftentimes are on opposite sides of our views on the market here. So I'm really excited to hear what Tom has to say and the sectors that he's most focused on and the sectors that he thinks kind of lead us out of the bear market. And again, I think that he is firmly in the camp that the bear market was a 2022 thing and that 2023 should be a much better year for stocks. I just want to mention one thing 
Danny, when you just mentioned this Humphrey Hawkins and Fed Chair Powell speaking on Tuesday in front of the Senate, and again, you know, this often tends to be a very politicized sort of event because he's getting questions from both sides of the aisle here. And when you think about all the Fed speak that we have seen, and when you think the data that we've been seeing that still flashes a little bit hotter than I think the Fed Chair Powell and Treasury Secretary would like to see, I mean, I can't imagine that that tune is going to change too much next week. And then I just want to mention another strategist real quickly in his morning note. This is David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research, who's also been on the pod a bunch, who I think very highly of. And again, a lot of people think of him similarly the way they think of Tom. If you're on the other side of Rosie, you think he's just a perma this, right? And everything that comes out of his mouth is just kind of reinforcing his worldview. He had a comment on his note this morning, and he tweeted something else also about when you're looking at where yields are. So we have the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield above 4%. And then when you look at short-term T-bills, I mean, what they are offering here. And he said, basically, you can take the N out of the whole Tina thing. There is no alternative. There clearly is an alternative. The other point I'll just make here is that he starts off his note this morning, the six-month Treasury yield, 5.1%, is on the verge of suppressing the S&P 500's earnings yield of 5.3%, reducing the impetus for taking on additional equity market exposure. These are the things. This is what's different this time. And I think that's really important because none of us have been in an environment like this as it relates to thinking about where to put money, in my opinion, I can't remember this in a very long time. And so, again, reinforcing what Fed Chair Powell is going to say on Tuesday, this is higher for longer territory. So just want to go back to what we highlighted last week, which was kind of in the subprime auto market and what to look out for. And lo and behold, on Friday night, as I mentioned here, my opening American Car Center filed bankruptcy. Okay, Danny, it's not a big deal. It's 300 employees across 10 states. But what happened? They had a failed bond offering of $222 million. Literally, they had to pull it. Why they pull it? Because investors weren't willing to buy those loans from them in order to free up America Car Center's balance sheet. And higher rates, for people that don't understand in the ABS market, where there's student loans, credit card receivables, auto loans, when that stops functioning or functions at a much lower price or higher rate, it impacts the profitability. We've talked about this with Upstart. We've talked about it with Affirm, any type of these consumer receivables. And so when we're talking about alternative investments that are out there, you have funds that historically have been buying these type of loans for a long time, and that's now ending. And guess what? There is no TALF. There is no troubled asset liquidity program that existed that came around 13 years ago to help these companies out of it. There is nobody that has your back. And this is kind of the reversion to the mean. And these companies that have existed for a long time on this belief that money will flow through the pipes and that they'll be able to offload, this is going to be a major theme. So when credit card debt starts to underperform, and it's not going to put American Express out of business, it's not going to put Discover out of business, but just it's a higher cost for everything. And I do not believe that's being priced in at all. So this normalization period is not just about PE on the markets. It's about how it impacts credit investors, debt investors, and all these companies. And for a company to literally go bankrupt overnight on a failed bond offering, that should scare the shit out of a lot of people. Danny, what you mention earlier, Hubert Humphrey or Andy Hawkins? What was that thing? Humphrey Hawkins. Humphrey Hawkins. Well, Dan mentioned it, but I think that's what it's called when the Fed chair testifies before the Senate. We started with saying point of no return. And here's one for you. So the point of no return could be in the form of Jerome Powell not returning. Because this thing, and when I say this thing, I mean everything around the Fed, everything about interest rates is going to get political really fast. For example, Senator Elizabeth Warren wants Biden to select a vice chair to counter Chair Jerome Powell, who she says, in quotes, has made clear that he will take extreme steps on interest rates and he's willing to put millions of people out of work. Another quote, Elizabeth Warren. If the Fed keeps pushing these extreme interest rate hikes, they can tip this whole economy off an economic cliff, warn a Massachusetts Democrat who opposed Powell's renomination in November of 2021, warned earlier this week. So right before our very eyes, this is becoming political. So when I say point of no return, it's for a number of different things. And one has to wonder how political this is going to get. With Lael Brainerd now coming in as the economic advisor, does she counter Jerome Powell's extraordinarily hawkish stance and tone? It's getting really interesting really quick because guess what? Right before our very eyes, which is another shitty song out there by Chicago or somebody, 
we're in a political cycle. We're in a basically run for reelection cycle that we're seeing with CPAC with the Republican side of the equation and what's going on on the Democratic side of the ledger as well, Dan. Yeah, no, I guess the point that I would make there is that we've been highlighting the oncoming fight with the debt ceiling. Just because Speaker McCarthy says that we're not going to default on our debt, we're not going to raise the limit, that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. Guys, you've been mentioning this on many occasions. There's a faction within the Republican Party that can actually hold mm -hmm. this whole situation hostage. Once we get by that, and we will get by that, then we are literally solidly in the presidential 2024 cycle. And at that point, any president would want, I guess, the Fed to take their foot off the pedal, right? And start to kind of. Well, ease hold on a second. Pressures. So uh, you're right in saying that because obviously, in terms of getting elected or getting reelected, you want the economy to be doing well. But I will tell you, the first candidate that runs on a platform, this is just my opinion, that, hey, you know what? We've had it really good for a really long time. We have to start taking our medicine collectively, and we're all in this together. Now, that's probably not going to be all that popular, but that's the right platform to run on because it's been – we've been in friggin' fantasy land now for four decades or so, Dan. Yeah, and Liz Warren is on the panel. That's the Senate Banking, Housing, Urban Affairs, so she will be there at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. And take a step back from that politics out of it. It's just numbers. It's just $32 trillion in debt and debt to GDP. And how do we get out of it? So whether there's a default, which Dan, you're probably right, it doesn't happen, but it will be politicized, this debt ceiling issue. And not good timing for where we stand right now with earnings starting to come down for 2023 and all this stuff hitting at the same time. So it definitely adds a lot more stress into the system when the macro backdrop behind us in the fiscal backdrop behind us is not pretty on top of the micro of these companies trying to manage their way. And listen, there's really interesting two investor days, Goldman Sachs and Tesla, two different industries, two very important companies occurred in the last few days. And I think we should kind of break some of those down because it kind of touches on a lot of things that are going on both in the economy and I think in market behavior. Yeah, let's talk about that. You and Dan, I'm sure have thoughts, but let me just touch on Goldman real quick. People say David Solomon's in the hot seat. And yeah, I think Whenever you're the CEO of Goldman Sachs, almost by definition, once you take that, you're in the hot seat, number one. Since 1969, when I think Gus Levy, I believe, took over, there have been nine CEOs of Goldman Sachs. So let's just say over the course of the last 53 or so years, effectively nine people. So the average duration tenure is somewhere around five and a half, six years. That's skewed a little bit because Lloyd was in the seat for, I think, 12 or so years. So with that said, David Solomon, who took over in October of 2018, and oh, by the way, the stock has effectively doubled since his tenure, is looking to, I would say, a bit long in the tooth. By this time next year, he will have been in the seat a little over six years-ish, and I'm sure there's a succession plan in place. So is he on the hot seat? Yeah, but it's not any different than anybody else that's been in the seat for that period of time. And I will tell you, and this pains me to say, David took the bank away from a fixed income currency commodities, earnings that were really sort of lumpy, as we say, and got them into a more stable businesses where there's some earnings visibility. Now, they're not being rewarded for it in terms of price to book. I think at current levels, Goldman's trading about 1.15 price to book. But I think it's just a matter of time before the market realizes that, wait a second, this is still the best franchise in this industry in the world. Yeah, you know, interestingly, and I think we talked about it about a month ago, there was an article in the New York Times, the blurred lines between Goldman's CEO day job and his DJ gig. Remember that? And I remember saying to you guys, listen, this is it. The knives are out for this guy. And so when you think about what was the focus of this investor day, and listen, let's take a step back here. 2022 was one of the worst years for investment banking in decades, okay, going back Back to the financial crisis and then going back to 20 years ago when we had that recession. So has 2023 gotten a whole heck of a lot better? No, it's actually really bad. So 2023 is probably not going to be a great year. What he is actually getting skewered a little bit about is this push that they went into the consumer stuff. And Danny, this is probably something right in your wheelhouse. It seemed a bit like style shift. Guy and I last May, I think it was, interviewed David for a CME event with Terry Duffy, and we spent a lot of time talking about Culture Guy, if you remember, talking about the makeup and the demographics of their employees. They were really young. I think the average age was like somewhere in the high 20s, and more than half of them were tech workers. So the idea of pushing into fintech and doing more consumer products and doing deals with Apple on those fronts and everything all sounded really sexy and a raging bull market, but they don't seem 
particularly great right now. The last point I'll just make is that, you know what, Goldman, going back to some of the things, Guy, that you experienced when you were there, I know that early in your career you spent some time as a trader there. These guys, they know how to make money in every market, and they also are going to be the top of the league tables when the bull market comes back as far as banking and almost every sort of product. So David probably has to kind of wait it out a little mm-hmm. bit. He probably has to take some guys out or gals in and around him. We're getting a little antsy, but he probably has more time than some of the headlines would kind of suspect. So they're exploring basically strategic alternatives in their, quote, consumer business. So he's hedging that out, and they're going to try to basically turn some of it around, but he really focused on the wealth management, the asset management, you know, and obviously the core banking unit. And in the same time, they're, I, I think they're going to take some risk assets down over time. So he basically painted a picture of shrinking parallel processing, trying to kind of salvage this consumer unit to, to some degree and maybe sell it if he can. So he didn't want to say we're shuttering it. So he's trying to maximize value there. Stock's flat for the year. I think it's kind of nowheresville, but I think Goldman is obviously the barometer and bellwether for Wall Street risk. And listen, I'm not going to name names, but he's been cited. Where's Waldo? He's been in a lot of fun places, Solomon, over the last you know six to eight weeks. And yes, he showed up for certain things. Not, I don't think he's long for that role over a period of time. And I think if things really get bad, I think they will just in the markets in general. I think he will end up being, quote, the fall guy there. And I don't know who is going to be there to replace him, but I don't think he will be in his role when we get to the end of 2023, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, they're clearly grooming John Waldron to take that. If you watch the Investor Day, he spoke a lot. So I would imagine he is the heir apparent. But Doug Cass has written about this, and I happen to know her. I'm not dropping names, but Erica Leslie is somebody that's going to wind up really climbing the ranks very quickly. They're going to probably groom her, is my sense, and Doug Cass as well, to be the first woman, long overdue CEO of Goldman Sachs. So let's see how that plays out. But Waldron, my sense is this time next year, we're having a conversation about John Waldron taking over at Goldman Sachs. All right, really quickly, this is kind of catching my eye, just the banks in general. I see we're midday on Thursday as we're recording this, and across the board, I see the major money center banks down one and a half to 2% or so. And again, today's the first day where the 10-year yield is solidly above mm-hmm. 4% here. And so, Danny, I'd love to get your take. I was thinking that you get this thing above 4%, given what the Fed speak has been, given just the two-year just below 5%. We talk about where Fed funds are going and the no longer predicting a strong likelihood of cuts in the back half of this year, bank stocks have acted pretty well this year for the most part. And so I'm curious, again, we could go through a litany of things of debt, of write-offs. You were quoting the subprime data as it relates to auto loans. Delinquencies are the highest they've been in 15 years or so. The mortgage situation is an interesting one, especially as, I mean, listen, if homeowners were looking to take money out of their houses, it's a really hard way to do it, especially with where rents are, if they were looking to sell. So talk to us a little bit about a higher for longer environment and what it means for bank stocks, in your opinion. Obviously, we've covered Capital One and a couple of the more subprime lenders, as they reported over the last month, weren't great. And they They didn't have great commentary. Is it going to work its way through to the major U.S. money center banks? Because that XLF, and again, it's a little funky. Berkshire is the largest holding. Just broke that uptrend that's been in place since the October lows. Every bank is somewhat different, but the one thing they all share in is the pain of higher rates for the most part, whether it's in their consumer lending business, which makes credit obviously go south a little bit, makes originations go south a little bit, certainly hurts M&A, merger and acquisition activity for the large scale Wall Street banks, certainly hurts IPO markets. And this is my point I made at the opening here is that we're kind of settling in here. And I think the realization is that things will be, forget rates higher for longer, things will be slower for longer as it relates to Wall Street banks. And when you start to see, again, not to harp on this thing, but failed bond sales in the auto market, That has repercussions for Bank America, for Wells Fargo. These companies have credit lines out to a lot of these lenders. And so if credit does indeed start to turn, and you look at affordability stuff happening right now, specifically in the auto market, the average rate on a new car is now 8.67%. The average rate on a used car is 13.65%. These have not been tested over time. This has been a long time since we've had these sustainably higher. So that has an impact. I know I'm talking about auto, but credit card originations and those sales and getting those off your balance sheet. I just think things are going to slow down. And so rates higher like this for longer has an impact on every aspect of a bank's business. And when you don't have the loan growth to take advantage of, quote, that spread from those businesses, you really can't benefit. And I think that's where we are. It's just kind of a deep breath here and see how things shake out. And I will tell you, 
CarMax, let's keep in mind, they reported on December 22nd, I believe. And yes, it wasn't a great quarter. They canceled their buyback. But let's keep an eye on that. They're going to be reporting, I think, here in early April. I don't think of a set date yet. That stock was $57 when they reported. It's now $10 higher than that. That's a name separate, Dan, non sequitur here that I would look at. But again, these are all kind of tied together. It's such a financialized system, this economy. And so rates has an impact. So Dan, long-winded answer to your question. And just to put a fine point on this, in January of 2022, average interest rate on a new car was 4.3%. That is now 6.9%. And you say, okay, not a big deal. Problem, of course, being that the price of cars has risen by about 20% over that period of time as well. So not only are you paying more in terms of your rate to borrow, cars cost more as well. And that is not, Dan, what do I call those types of things? Wow, we haven't busted this one out in a while. Please. A witch's brew. Yes, that's what we call it, Dan. Yeah, one other thing on that note. There was an article, I think, out on Bloomberg that consumers are basically upside down. You hear about people up being upside down in their homes. People are upside down in their cars. And that is one thing that is certainly going to have an impact in a good way on inflation coming down are used car prices. But people that bought cars for $40,000 three years ago, they were financing them. Now it's time to re-up potentially that financing. And guess what? Car's not worth 40000 It's worth a lot less. So they're literally leaving the keys probably in dealerships or banks, parking lot, whatever. So let's not forget that as well. All assets were so inflated for so long and things were basically financed at various prices. So it's not just your home that people need to be concerned about. And that's a very disturbing trend going on. Watch what I do here. Typically, it's around the holiday season that I put ribbons on things, but I'm going to put a nice little ribbon on something for us all right now. There was a song that the band Tesla did a remake of it, of course. Signs, signs, everywhere signs. Now, in a minute, I'm sure both you and Dan will wax poetic about the company called Tesla. But here's a sign for you that I don't think the media made a big deal out of it, and maybe it's not a big deal, but I think it speaks to some of the things that are going on out there underneath the surface. Amazon employees will be able to use stock as collateral for home loans through this online mortgage lender, better.com. Now, I will tell you, when companies start being creative with things like this, by the way, for those playing our home game, Amazon, the stock, has not been a particularly good stock over the last five years. As a matter of fact, if I were to go to my fact set machine and take a look, I'm willing to bet that the price of Amazon today is the same freaking price that it was five or six years ago understanding that it's had some rallies along the way, but here we are sort of meandering around. So that to me is the aforementioned sign that we should be looking for. All right, let's do this, Tesla. Here's the main event. Uh, here. here it okay, is. So, I did, so it was so, coming. So it was the investor day yesterday. It was supposed to start at four o'clock. It didn't start until I think after five o'clock. I was on the set of Fast Money. Alyssa looks at me. She's asking, this is live on air. You know, like, why late? Well, why late? The guy's CEO of Tesla, of SpaceX, of Twitter, of Neuralink, of the boring company. I mean, the list goes on and on. So yeah, cut the guy a little slack here. I mean, listen, this thing was a big dud. If you were just to kind of look at what the bulls were expecting, I mean, they were literally expecting some AI bot to cure cancer with the name Tesla on it or something like that. I don't even know, right? So the stock gap's down 8% today. It's down, I don't know, rallied a little bit off the lows. I just want to make one really quick point. Dan Benton, legendary tech investor, when he was at Goldman Sachs prior to running his hedge fund Andor, this was in, I think, late 80s, early 90s, he had the 20 rules for technology investing. And he's been on our pod a couple of times, and we've talked about them. He's also been an early SpaceX and Tesla bull. So I'd love to have Dan back. But I just really want to go back to these 20 rules of investing. The first rule, sell technology stocks when estimates are being reduced. Number two, buy technology stocks only for positive earning surprises. And then positive earnings surprises, number three, occur when revenue and earnings growth are accelerating. Now, here's the thing. If I want to skip all the way down to number 20, it says, don't forget rule number one. I just want to be really <laughs> clear right here. So obviously, Tesla had a very bad year last year. This year, it's up a whole heck of a lot. It kind of made that low at about 100 bucks. It's trading about 190 right now. Okay, so it had a huge rip. I just want to make one really quick point. I'm looking at fact set right here. I'm looking at 2023 earnings expectations. Consensus is calling for basically flat earnings. It's also calling for revenues to gain about 25%. But here's the most important part about this. Gross margins are expected to go from 25.5% last year down to 22% this year. And I just want to make this last point. The biggest takeaway from yesterday's investor day is how many 
billions of dollars, how many tens of billions of dollars they are going to spend on capex building gigafactories all over the place. This is at a time where basically competition is everywhere. China is a huge market that is only going to become a more difficult environment for them. It's a huge, huge place for them as far as future growth, manufacturing, consumer demand, access to rare earth materials. So I just want to make the point is that margins actually could be hit worse than I think consensus is looking for this year, especially with those big price cuts, especially if we see competition and especially if we see a recession. So to me, this story is not over yet, man. And that's the biggest takeaway that I had from this. When they make the movie, on Elon Musk and Tesla, it'll open with this. In a world where one <laughs> man introduces Master Plan 3. I mean, the guy is so full of shit, but let me just say this, Dan. I love everything you said. The stock doesn't, hasn't, maybe someday will trade on fundamentals. It trades on this on-the-come nonsense that's going on. If it traded on fundamentals, we know where the stock would be. So I appreciate the analysis. I'm somewhat sarcastic here, but honestly, like I've been dealing with this thing for seven years. So someday it will. And I thought we had that moment late last year, and I think we will have it again. But listen, when you make a comment, when the CFO gets up there and says, oh, yeah, we're going to need to spend $150 billion to get to our 20 million car run rate and that type of CapEx. And people realize, oh, they didn't unveil. They kept two cars basically under a sheet so that, oh, wonder what that is. It was a very horrible. To be honest, I watched fits and starts minutes at a time. I can't even stomach watching it. But watching the people in the audience, I'm thinking to myself, what kind of cult is this people that fly from around the world to go attend something like this? And that's the whole story. So I always tell people, read your Q's and K's. And Tesla has been putting out for a long time DOJ investigations. People just want to ignore all of that. At some point, that will matter. And in reading Q's and K's, quick shout out to two other Tesla bears, Porter Collins and Vincent Daniel who, like me, read Qs and Ks, and a 10K came out today on Silvergate and obviously said there's a going concern language and so forth, and they can't assess what the valuation is on their balance sheets. And Dan, someday when that stuff starts to matter with a name like Tesla, that's when this stock will really fold up on itself. So it's interesting. Silvergate is now, I think, a $300 million company or below. So I want to tread lightly here. But remember, this stock was north of $200, I think, in November of 2021. So amazing job by both Vinny and Porter, and obviously you as well. Quickly about Tesla, though, I will tell you that I thought the right thing to do in the earnings when they reported was to fade it. The stock was trading, I think, in the mid-150s. Obviously, that was wrong. But we did think 225 should be a level that it failed at, and effectively, that's what happened. And if you go back and look, 225-ish is a level that we broke down from in October of last year. So now you have to ask yourself, if you're looking to get into the stock on the long side, what's the right level? I would submit it's probably around 165. I will tell you, though, that's one of those things that if we don't hold, one has to wonder if we're just going to sort of cascade back to the levels we saw a few months ago. But it's something to keep in mind. 165 to me is a line in the sand. And that's something I'd be looking for in the relatively short future, Dan. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Danny, I was listening to you, Porter and Vinny, last week, and you guys were talking about Tesla, a little preview on what are we doing. That was a great convo, by the way. But it was interesting to note that those guys went out of their way to say, listen, when the stock fell out of bed from early December to early January, from 200 to 100, they said they dramatically reduced their short position. Of course they did, right? And so it's just interesting that I've been a critic for a whole host of reasons of Musk and the strategy, and I think to a large degree, the investor sentiment towards the stock and him individually. I did not start shorting this stock until it was 165 after earnings. Now, I was fighting it all the way up to 220 or whatever, but let me tell you something. As of today, I'm up on my position here, and I've dramatically reduced it. Did it get too large? Yeah, it did, but that's kind of trading out of a position a little bit too, and I also feel like this thing, I think the technicals have broken. I think the fever might have broken. I think the focus, Danny, to your point, that it doesn't really trade on fundamentals, but if we are in a year right now after last year where whatever the reason whether it was him selling 10 billion at a clip of tesla stock to fund his twitter deal or whatever at some point if earnings estimates start to come down from the bulls and margins continue to get worse it's no longer a margin story it's no longer an earnings appreciation story especially when you consider how much they just told us this was the only material fact that i think is important they're going to spend an additional 100 billion dollars to get to their 20 million 
150 billion. Yeah, 150, including the 28 billion that they've already spent. Okay. So my point is at a time where all this competition is coming online and they've already had to dramatically cut their prices, which is obviously the reason for the margin degradation. I mean, to me, this seems like guy, a little bit of a witch's brew. Oh, I like what you did there. Yeah. Well, it's good to know that Musk said that the demand for our cars in terms of people's desire to own them is infinite because, you know, I have a lot of infinite desires as well. But listen, they told you something else too, Dan, that they're not going to earn enough to fund that type of CapEx. So could there be a equity offering on the horizon? I don't know. You know what, Danny? That's a great point. Is there going to be a company equity offering to raise cap to fund their business. That's how companies usually do that sort of thing, right? Wait, I but thought he said they're, they're not going to sell stock he anymore. He is not going to sell stock. So he was, uh, think about how much stock he sold. I think it was $30 billion since its highs in November. So he's front running the company's need to fund the business. And let me tell you, Twitter's business is doing horribly. And he's going to actually have to probably sell more stock soon, which he said he's not going to do, because they're going to end up missing debt payments because their revenues in December were supposedly down 35, 40% or something like that. And they're probably only getting worse right now. As I mentioned earlier, we are going to have a conversation with Tom Lee. And I want to segue that with something that David Einhorn said. But I also said that we're going to take some of our viewer questions. Is it viewer or listener? Listener. It would be listener. We're going to take some of our listener questions. Although I'm sure people view us in in some way, (laughs) shape, or form as well. And we're going to get to that in a second. But before we go to the aforementioned Tom Lee, I want to sort of throw something out there. David Einhorn is sort of a legend in our world. Last year, his returns were 36.6%. That's a pretty good year. It's not Porter and Vinny good, but it's pretty good. On halftime report this week, I'm quoting David Einhorn. I think we should be bearish on stocks and bullish on inflation. I think we're in a policy now, which is probably pretty good for Main Street, which I happen to agree with, by the way, but it's going to be difficult and increasingly difficult for financial assets. I think that both long-term and short-term rates are headed higher and probably higher than what people are expecting. Here's what interested me amongst many things. The Fed does want stock prices lower. They've made that clear. I think it would be better if they cared less about the stock market in either direction, but it sort of is what it is. So this is not Guy Adami, some hack talking. This is David (laughs) Einhorn, somebody that's a legend in our world, sort of amplifying and sort of galvanizing and validating some of the things that we've said a number of times. Guy, don't sell yourself short. You're a tremendous hack. I couldn't hack. get a borrow a, on it if I tried. You're a tremendous hack. All right, real quickly here, because on that front, our friend John Butters over there at FactSet, who writes the Earnings Insight blog that drops every Friday, he had a comment last week that really stuck out to me when you're talking about the focus of the stock market and, let's say, corporations focus on inflation. He said that 325 S&P 500 companies have cited inflation during their earnings calls for the fourth quarter. That seems like a lot, 325 of 500. That's probably what, a little less than two thirds or something like that. But here's the thing, that's the lowest number since the third quarter of 2021. That's a 20% decline from the third quarter of 2022. So Danny, what I think is interesting about that stat is that at least C-level executives who are speaking to investors are using it less as an excuse now than they were in 2021 at a time where the Fed refused to acknowledge what Guy already knew, that inflation was going to be pesky and persistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've said the best CEOs, the ones you'll find are the ones that don't blame the Fed and just react to how they need to run their business. I will tell you that one other thing, we just got a lot of European inflation data in the last couple of days, and it is accelerating there still. So it's not pretty. So one other note on that ECB is probably going to go 50 basis points when they meet in a few weeks. Listen, I've known David Einhorn a long time been a great stock picker his entire career. And again, the lost art of that from 2000, kind of 10 till 2021, now it's back in vogue. And so being able to understand those type of markets, David sees it. He had some not great years, obviously, during the cycle that was manipulated, obviously, by the Fed at QE. But now I think it's his time to shine. And I would be paying very close attention to everything that he said, because he has a lot of scars to prove it over the last few years. But I think now is going to be his time to shine. When we come back, the much ballyhooed and asked for conversation with the great Tom Lee. And after Tom Lee, you sent us some questions. So we're going to take a shot and we're going to answer them. Stick around. Introducing event contracts from CME Group for individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost with predefined risk, 
Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. Tom, it's wonderful to have you back with us. I think it was a year or so ago you were with us. A lot's changed since then, but in some ways a lot has not changed at all. You know, we get labeled, we being Dan, myself, Danny, Perma, Bears, and that's really not true. I mean, I will tell you, in June, we collectively got bullish. The market saw about an 18% rally. The same thing happened in October. I think what surprised me specifically is the health and the well-being and the sort of stickiness of the market here since early December. So our bear thesis has been out there. I think people know but our listeners have been clamoring to have another voice on, a counter voice, and there is no better counter voice than you. So welcome once again to On The Tape. Yeah, good to be here. Tom, your bull thesis is out there. Unfortunately, when you see Tom Lee on these television shows, they become very soundbitey. So we obviously have some time. So give us a few minutes as to what the bull thesis that you have is made up of. I think we should maybe just lay a little bit of common ground. And I think the common ground that we can see is the world is coping with a huge inflation surge. And there's now uncertainty sort of at what stage we are here because inflation could either be slowing. And if it's slowing, then it changes the reaction function of the Fed. Or inflation could be sticky and it's going to be a problem for a while and monetary policy has to be tight. And of course, there's a lot of debates about how effective monetary policy has been, so how much the Fed has to go. And at the same time, we have to deal with regular business cycle dynamics. So it's a very confusing time for markets. And I think in general, because of that uncertainty, there is going to be a bias for people to glom onto a narrative. So people are going to be narrative driven and even as simple as, oh, well, you don't want to fight the Fed. So markets are going to be tough or you can't buy stocks until earnings bottom, et cetera. And when we look at the landscape, I think there's three reasons why we think stocks will probably dramatically outperform what people expect this year. And there's more than three, but I would say that there's three big ones. I think the first and most important is that even without knowing how far the Fed has to go with inflation, the Fed is no longer higher in a hurry. So the Fed's reaction to data now is that we are going to probably see rates continue to rise, but that the manner that they're going to raise rates is going to become more predictable. And you might say, well, doesn't that mean that stocks can't go up as long as the Fed is raising rates? And that's actually not true. Since 1970, there have been 14 rate cycles where the Fed was raising rates over more than a 24-month period. And of those 14, 11 times the stock market managed to compound with gains. And in fact, during Greenspan's era, he was raising rates five times and we didn't have five stock market crashes. So it's not an aphorism to say markets don't bottom until we have a recession. Fed can be tightening and markets can still rise. The second reason I think stocks are actually going to start to surprise here actually has to do with 
what I would say to me is market expansion breadth that has only coincided with confirming major lows. So our view is that stocks bottomed on October of last year. And on January 12th, we had three market breadth expansion events that only have taken place seven times out of the last 16,000 trading days. So it is so rare to see this type of market breadth expansion. And what it was is there are technical measures, but one's called a Welly breadth thrust, which is a measure of advancing volume over total over the last 10 days. And then there's the Walter Deemer breakaway momentum measure, which is advanced versus decline ratios over over two. And there's three consecutive days of up volume. But the point is that it's only happened seven times and they've all happened to confirm a major low. And then on top of that, I would actually add that there's been some seasonal arguments. You know, if you look at markets year to date, on the first five days, the S&P rose more than one and a half percent. It's only happened seven times since 1950. And seven of seven times the markets actually strengthened into the end of the year with the median gain of 26%. So I think there's a seasonal and a market internals argument. And then the third reason we're constructive is that I think the earnings delivery picture is actually going to start improving. I mean, this is probably the biggest debate. For those who don't want to buy stocks until earnings bottom, tech remains the most important sector. It's, you know, it's 40% essentially of the market and earnings revisions are bottoming there. And if the dollar remains sort of soft or even if dollar volatility falls, that becomes a tailwind. I mean, last year, strong dollar subtracted 7% out of EPS growth. So I think that there's a chance that earnings for tech, which is the most important group, are going to be surprising. And then that allows tech to resume leadership. And of course, that's going to pull up the market. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be half full on stocks this year. But it's not as simple as saying the Fed's going to be cutting rates. It's not as simple as saying like inflation's going to two. Although I think there's a good chance inflation's actually tracking towards 2% by the middle of the year. That's a big call. Let's take a step back, Tom. You mentioned that in past rate increase cycles, it's not uncommon for stocks to rally. And the last time that we were in one, right, before the Fed started raising interest rates last March was 2018. And we saw that the Fed, I think they said at the time they were on autopilot, they were doing those quarter point increases. And at the time, the stock market was at all time highs. But there was a certain point when Fed funds got over 2% and the 10 year got over 3%, the stock market with just a little bit of fear of global growth went Meaning went down 20% in a straight line. And when I think about last year at the lows, the S&P was down 27% or so, closed down about 20%. And we had the largest Fed funds increase from basically 0% to where we are now, just we're going to be at five in the not so distant future. So talk to me a little bit about that, because it just seems like we're probably not at the appropriate price for stocks right here relative to this higher for longer scenario, because I just don't see the Fed unless something really bad happens with the economy here or globally really pivoting to cutting rates anytime soon. Well, Dan, I agree. I don't think the Fed is going to be cutting rates anytime soon. But again, I don't think that that's what's necessary for stocks to actually have a good year. And a few things to keep in mind, including what does it mean that Fed funds are now close to 5%. I mean, we have to remember that is reliquifying a lot of the economy. I mean, savers and people who own cash are getting more income. I mean, there's been some distortion this year because of the COLA adjustments, inflation adjustments to income, but it's also been better for even businesses like active management. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is one of the contributors to core services, CPI inflation has been financial services that's inflationary because interest rates have gone up. So, I mean, the Fed itself is contributing to an inflation increase. Just keep that in mind. The cost of money, I think, may be appropriate here at five on cash. But what's interesting is the 10-year hasn't followed. You know, the 10-year is at 4%, so it's 100 basis points lower. And the 10-year at 4% is still something you're paying 25 times for. So, Let's say the Fed does another 100 and the 10 year goes to 4.5%. Keep in mind that since 1900, when you look at the periods when the 10 year is between 3.5 and 5.5%, you'll be surprised. The median PE is 19.7 times. When PE is highest since 1900, so 122 years of history, have taken place 
when 10 year is roughly four to four and a half percent. More importantly, you might say, oh, is that only the dot com? No, that I think that was eight distinct periods where the 10 year had been in that range. And the range is actually pretty narrow. It's like 15 to 30 times. So this is actually a time when if you do raise cost of money, and this is not say going to happen next month, but when you raise the cost of money, it allows good businesses to actually build competitive advantage. And that's why earnings do well. And that's why PE actually stays high. I'm not saying the Fed wants the stock market to go up, but I think it's a misconception to think that because of where monetary policy rates are here, that it actually has to cause a financial accident. And then at the end of the day, I think positioning is just as important to appreciate here because the VIX last year got to 25. So it showed there was a high level of concern, but I think a lot of the equity return this year is going to have a lot to do with whether delivered vol on FX and bonds and earnings drops. If delivered volatility of those drop, I mean, one, you guys all know if delivered volatility of bonds drops, you know, the yields are going to fall. But I also think there's something that people aren't appreciating on valuations, especially in both where the 10 year and the two year are, but the two year yield actually includes a lot of inflation risk premium. And actually my team's been sort of using a lot of different models because the Fed has proposed several models for this. But if you look at inflation risk premium, the differential between what people expect to be for two year inflation versus 10 year almost explains the entire inversion of the yield curve. So if you think inflation risk is higher now than it is 10 years from now, the curve is inverted, but that inflation risk premium needs to be added back to equity risk premium. So actually stocks aren't expensive versus bonds. It's bonds and stocks are both reflecting an inflation risk that is penalizing both the value of a bond and the value of a stock. So Tom, you were on last year, I believe, and we talked about you and I worked together in the late 90s. You and I both watched together these wireless companies and everything when things were valued on a multiple of revenue. And when it finally came time to value these things because it got the market got very choppy. Yes, Fed funds were already at five to six percent back then, but they were raising. We saw what can happen in that type of environment. And I guess one of the questions I want to ask you is we've had 13 years of basically free money of the Fed having our back. And I realize maybe tech doesn't qualify as much as all the other financial engineered companies, et cetera, but there is a lag effect from when the Fed starts to raise rates. And we are in uncharted territory, bearish or bullish, I think we all agree on that as well. The Fed raising 75 bips a clip. This is all uncharted territory. I guess what I'm having problem reconciling with is how that's gonna work its way into the market. Because I think we're just at the beginning stages of kind of seeing something like that. And my other question for you would have to do with, what do you mean by a 25X return because the 10 years at 4%? Well, that one's easy. I'm just inverting the yield. So 4%, is a 25 PE for a bond, right? Because if you look at it as a coupon versus the price, what multiple of the coupon are you paying or the yield to worst? But Danny, you're bringing up really the important point, like, because I used to cover stocks and for much of the time I was an equity analyst and I was an equity analyst for 15 years, I didn't think there was much correlation between well-managed companies and good stocks. I think for much of the time I was an analyst covering equities, there were many instances of great stocks, but they were terribly run. But I don't think that's been the case the last few years. I think corporate America really went through the real Rubicon and got a lot smarter about how they manage their business. Because, you know, they survived the pandemic, which was a complete shutdown of the economy. And then they survived a huge inflation plus bullwhip effect, which was very disruptive. I mean, the supply chain plus overordering plus inflation, they managed through that. And then they got very strong signals last year from the Fed that they were going to go higher in a hurry. So that's why CEO confidence collapsed. And that's why the PMIs collapsed. And you had a very big inventory drawdown. So we're kind of coming into 2023. In any other cycle, if this was just an inflation shock and a hiking cycle, we should have already seen a lot of bankruptcies by now. I mean, that's actually what happened in the 70s and 80s. But companies pushed out their maturity wall and they're managing margins better. And then they endured a massive FX headwind that's turning around. And so I think you are going to see failures. But high yield had its second worst ever year in the history of the index. 
the only year that was worse was 2008. So the high yield market has already made cost of money expensive and it's really obliterated a lot of folks. But I think now we're just dealing with companies having survived that challenge. But it's a great question. I mean, that's what I think is keeping people cautious. But I do think companies have earned a little bit of credibility because of how they managed the pandemic and then that initial supply chain whip plus inflation. Well, you bring up a great point, and I think it's key. I think this has become a stock picker's market. And when you generalize, not just you people, about market levels, and we do it on the show all the time, you might indeed be right that the low was in in October around 3,500. That might indeed be the case. But my thing is, to your point you just made, the good CEOs, the good companies that have been through cycles, that know how to do this, that don't blame the Fed for everything. To me, it's a real stock picker's bottom-up market. But the one comment you just made about reliquifying the system I don't see it that way. I see it as kind of a burn back through the atmosphere for a lot of companies that don't understand this, that haven't had to survive, they haven't do it. And I guess for me, it's not so much about the market levels as it is the internals. And I just see that maybe you can run screens on that. And I know you guys run screens on companies that have debt maturing and things like that. I just feel like it's gonna be very turbulent. I didn't think we'd see a lot of bankruptcies yet. I think we're going to see them as people need to come to the market to refinance. So going through kind of bottom up work, which I know you don't necessarily do anymore, but sector specific, I know you like tech, I think you like industrials, and I think you like energy, if I'm not mistaken on those three, but maybe walk through the base case for that, because I think this is a stock picker's market. And while you don't pick stocks, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Well, I sent you guys some stuff, some slides, and I'd be glad to walk through all three. I mean, first to me, the case for owning technology is that I think a lot of damage has been done tech multiples have come in. And that may be something that we have to be a little less certain of where they bought them. But as you know, you never buy tech on valuations. You really have to buy them when you actually think that there's a growth of the addressable market. And tech's use case is actually exponentially growing right now because one, there's a shortage of labor globally. And everyone thinks the solution to fixing the labor problem is cause a recession. It doesn't solve anything. I mean, so what if you cause a million job losses? Guess what? I mean, as soon as the economy starts growing again, you're going to run out of people again. Like you can't just keep jamming a recession to try to fix a labor shortage. The only really way to structurally fix a labor shortage is to replace human endeavors with machine units. And that's where automation, whether it's industrial or tech is the only solution. In fact, we have a slide in the deck I sent you that shows in the two previous periods of labor shortage, 1948 to 67 and 1991 to 98, guess what? What sector parabolically outperformed tech? It's because tech spending as a percentage of GDP went parabolic. So I think tech use case is actually strengthening now. And of course, I don't know, maybe it is AI and chat GBT or whatever, but whatever the thing is, is that there's going to be capital formed and it's going to replace human units. And that's actually going to fix our inflation problem because tech doesn't take vacation and they don't need inflation adjustments. The case for owning industrials is very easy for me too. Industrials are coming off just an awful decade. I mean, last year they outperformed, but it was the only year out of the last eight. I mean, they've been terrible. But we have a chart that shows the time to buy industrials is when the PMIs are below 47. So you want to buy industrials when the ISM is below 50. And when the ISM is below 47 and is beginning to turn up, which by the way, that's the confirmation we got this week, guess what? Industrials outperform 98% of the time. An average gain outperformance of 32% over the next 12 months. So this is literally the best time to be overweight industrials. And I know it's counter to someone's view that, well, if we have a recession, I wonder if the stock market's already priced in a recession. So. And then third for energy, I mean, to me, energy is becoming quality growth. And we've thrown a lot of things at energy and the companies have taken all that capital constraint. They've been capital constrained and negative sentiment and they become better companies. And I mean, to me, energy is symptomatic of like how corporate America is better. And so for the next five years, they're under owned and they have a pretty good roadmap and evaluation expansion story because they're trading at 10 times forward earnings right now. And by the way, that's true of the overall market. You know, if you take out FANG, the S&P PE is 14.8 times. If someone does think the market's expensive, I mean, 14.8 isn't terribly demanding. It's interesting, Tom. In your notes, you talked about 
don't go full Vulcan. You were obviously referring to Paul Volcker during his tenure as Fed chair. And the point you made is stocks actually did very well under his stewardship. And it's interesting and it's true. Here's my pushback quickly. Debt to GDP was not nearly the problem then, in my opinion, that it is now. I think we're approaching, Danny probably has it in front of him, but 130, 135%-ish, doesn't really matter. It's at levels that historically no developed economies ever really been able to recover from. So you're right in your assessment. Does that concern you, the debt levels, not only here, but globally? Yes. I'm not a fan of debt. I don't really want to see the world drowning in debt. As you guys know from finance class 101, inflation benefits debtors because they can inflate the real cost of their debt. So in a strange way, the governments have a paradoxical incentive to actually create inflation. I mean, we can see it already because tax receipts are higher and the deficit shrinking and the debt burden is going to shrink just because nominal GDP is higher. I know it's weird, even though in the short term, it's causing some financial pain because of the timing difference between when taxes adjust. But it's a great question. I mean, this happened in the 50s when there was a lot of debt and there was a financial repression that followed to try to contain inflation. I think that cat's out of the bag here. And I don't expect America to default on its debt. So it's a great question. I mean, in a strange way, I just think that it's going to make corporate debt a lot more credit worthy looking. I don't know, maybe in five years, we'll Apple borrow at a lower cost than the 10 year. Like, so we have negative credit spreads. I mean, isn't that possible? Maybe the risk-free rate is like FANG. It's a spread to the FANG. I don't know. It's a great question. I don't think it's a good thing. And a lot of those FANG names, uh, and we don't use it. We use MAGA around here, Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Amazon. When you think about the balance sheets that those companies have and how much stock they've been buying back, even Amazon instituted a buyback before rates started going higher. And it's worked out very well for those companies. I go back to a comment. I think it was Dan Loeb at Third Point made this a month or two ago. It was a tweet. I wouldn't be like clutching to your pearls, waiting for the past leaders to kind of lead us out of the bear market that happened in 2022. So talk to me a little bit about that. You just went through Fang a little bit and some of those big mega cap tech leaders. What do you think about that comment? Because to me, I actually think about what energy's contribution to S&P earnings, how it's going to be trailing off this year, Tom. And I guess if we were to come out of this bear, and for all intents and purposes, if you think about how much we are off the October lows, we're kind of out of it, but it's wavering here. And if you think of the technicals and you think of where the S&P and the NASDAQ are right now, they're flirting with those 200-day moving averages. They're flirting with those uptrends that have been in place from their October and Jan lows for the, for the NDX. It doesn't feel great right here, and I would think that you would need those mega cap tech names to get back on their horses and lead out of this. So talk to us a little bit about that, because I guess you could go back every cycle and say, yeah, the past leaders were not the ones into the new cycle. I don't disagree with that statement because, you know, I've been through a lot of cycles. I've been covering markets since 93, so 30 years. And I might just make a conditional change to that statement. I think that the narrative of leadership changes every cycle. The only reason is because empirically speaking, the NASDAQ has led every market bottom since 1960. So out of every market bottom, the NASDAQ's outperformed. So it's actually a fact that tech tends to lead, but the composition and the stories that lead actually totally change. I'll give you an example, like after the dot-com fiber bust, the kings of the dot-com and fiber were like the Celex, and uh, internet capital groups and all these like silly names. But guess what outperformed starting in 03? Internet service provider. So everybody who benefited from the collapse of fiber outperformed. So Priceline, eBay, Amazon, they all actually outperformed because they took advantage of the collapse of pricing. In the telecoms world, wireless massively outperformed because fiber got cheap. So it was tech. It just yeah, but, was. But Tom, so it's a really good point there, though. But if you're thinking about those in market cap terms, they might have been performance leaders, but they weren't the things that led the market, right? And if you think of the biggest names. Well, actually, they contributed a lot to the S&P gains, Dan. I think you're bringing up a good point. Like, if someone's asking me, like, is Fang out of the, I don't know how many, six tickers or something, I'm going to say 
three or two could become leaders again. But the six out of six, not really. Yeah. My only point was, is if you think about the largest market cap companies in 2000, it was Yahoo, it was Microsoft, it was Nortel, Lucent, Intel. There was a handful of those names. Microsoft didn't make a new high for 15 years or something like that. So there was a lot of underperformance from some of the mega caps. But I'm actually in the camp that I think the only way that the market starts another meaningful bull run is if you have Apple, if you have Microsoft, if you have Google, I think that there's going to be stocks like Tesla that go the opposite way. And they're going to be like the poster children for the excess here. Yeah. And Dan, by the way, there's a difference between the largest market caps and the leaders too. Fair enough. But I just think that there's such a disproportionate concentration among those top six tickers now, and they all look so similar. Yeah, it's a good point. And they all have very, actually very similar valuations. So I think it's interesting in your notes. And we're going to put your slides in our show notes. You say X Fang, but again, those stocks are trading at some very high multiples where expected growth is not particularly great for some of them going forward. And now all of a sudden now you see Microsoft with this chat GPT integration into Bing, and you you have investment houses or research houses saying that it could add 20% to EPS over the next five years. That was on no one's bingo card a year ago for a $2 trillion market cap company. So listen, new innovation amongst these massive platform companies would clearly start a new bull market when you think about what percentage they are of the S&P and the NASDAQ. I just don't think it's going to be something that's proportionate among all of them. Guy started this conversation by saying that we are not strategists. We don't do the sort of quantitative work that you do across multiple asset classes, multiple geographies. You guys do very thorough work. And then from a qualitative standpoint, you talk to some of the biggest investors out there. Let's talk about sentiment a little bit here. How does that factor into your bullish case for stocks in 2023? Because from where I'm sitting, it's kind of hard to find too many bulls. And that is, that's bullish. You're one of them. You're not one of these guys. You're not a hyperbolic guy. You're not pounding the table. You're not, that's not your style, but you have not wavered. And it was kind of interesting late last year without naming names, there was a couple very prominent bullish strategists who get a lot of airtime in the financial media who changed course now. And they seem a bit defensive when the market was ripping. The NASDAQ at its highs recently was up 16, 17%. The S&P was up nearly 10%. Now it's given a lot of that back. So how are you thinking about sentiment here? Because you're on an island a little bit from a bullish standpoint as it relates to strategists. I mean, sentiment's horrible. With retail, it's easy to see because if you look at like trending surveys like AAII, never in the last 40 years has sentiment persisted this negatively in AI. Or if you look at retail cash at 1.8 trillion, that's 200 billion more today on the sidelines in May 2020. But the problem with sentiment is that it creates a lot of type two errors. People can be bearish. Like last year, like you guys were saying, people were bearish last year and the market went down. So it, being bearish isn't a condition to prove that you have a bullish setup, but it can be a bullish setup if the fundamental or technical picture improves. But right now people are bearish. I mean, I just did a Zoom this morning with one of our large clients on the West Coast and they're uber cautious. Although they do like some stocks where they think earnings can beat. So it's to them, they are just treating this as a stock picking market, which is good for active managers because that's positively reinforcing. I mean, I don't think they really care if what the index does as long as they don't get blindsided like last year. But what I think has almost no type two errors, which I pointed out, is the market expansion breadth, the quality of that improvement, and the seasonal. You know, like the seasonal, the calendar has never really been wrong. So they don't have any type two errors. I mean, sentiment does. So as I've mentioned, our fundamental view is the Fed is going to raise, but if, if they're becoming more predictable, volatility is going to fall. And that's actually good for multiples. And so I mean, it's tough. I don't blame anyone for saying they just want to sit on the sideline and figure it out. So, Tom, I guess one area where I think if you're right, you're going to be right, and that's that you think earnings may have indeed bottomed or they're going to grow from here, I should say. And some people on the street are looking for $190 to $200 in earnings on the S&P. Some are at $225, $235, right? And you always have a premium multiple on a trough. I personally don't think we've troughed yet, so I think kind of remains to be seen. But the one chart which you picked to marry your bullish thesis is to kind of this March, April, and you mentioned before when stocks have a down year and then they're up 1.4, 1.5%, they tend to do well following months and so forth. So it seems like you're calling, and listen, there's plenty of bears out there that will cherry pick 
data point. I could take an inverted yield curve. I could make as many bullish and bearish cases for anything using any type and with those stats. But what's really interesting to me is that you actually had a single day, and I brought this up in the first part of our show here, is that March 7th, you actually used that as a day for some reason. I don't know if that was the stars aligning, but March 7th is actually Powell's testimony in front of the Senate. And not all the people are talking about that. No one's even aware that he's testifying in a semi-annual. It's kind of interesting that that was the day, and I'm sure that that was random. It's totally random. Yeah, no, I think that's really funny because it may indeed be an inflection point. But to your point, to make your argument that March and April, what if March and April aren't good? Do you push it out to May and June? Or do you say that didn't work? So now I'm going to find, I'm not being cheeky here. I'm saying now I'm going to find another technical aspect that gives my thesis. How do you manage that? Because you really are making a tactical March, April call here, at least in the very short term. Yeah. I mean, in a way, March, April will be important to see if it's tracking what we're saying. I would say, interestingly, as you're bringing it up, the template we're using, which is the first five days, a lot of what you just described comes from us taking the first five days of this year and then picking a composite what those were saying. And on that previous composite, it said that we would probably start rolling over hard February 16th. And actually this year, that's actually the date the market started taking in the gut. And then it does coincide with early March, March 7th. But of course, to me, the cadence of the data starts to make sense because that's near FOMC and then all the incoming inflation prints, which we think will show improvement relative to the hot numbers we saw in January. So you're right. If March, April doesn't rally, then it's going to disqualify what we're saying. But I would actually say if we're using just that seasonal template, it's actually served pretty well because it's said to be a strong January, which it ended up being. And that was just after five days. It was saying the rest of January would be strong. The market would probably roll starting February 16th, which it did. But it actually means sometime between today, which is March 2nd and March 7th, the market should find its footing and actually, you know, the next eight weeks could be up as much as 8%. The NFL does this thing and more and more leagues are starting to do it. They call it self-scouting. And basically they'll look at their own game film and say, okay, where are we vulnerable? I ask that or I bring that up because I know for a fact that you're extraordinarily introspective and you're always looking for flies in the ointment. How can I be wrong? What blows up my thesis? So Having thought through that, which you have, maybe you can share that with us as well. The biggest risk is actually the reflexivity of inflation, because if we all accept that inflation's higher, then we don't protest and push back against higher prices. And that means, oh, we'll give this guy a 10% raise because that's what you're supposed to do. And then Every company gets away with raising prices, and then it's pretty soon you've got a institutionalized higher embedded inflation rate that the Fed absolutely has to panic about. Fortunately, the surveys are moving the opposite direction because, as you know, both the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer of Expectations for Inflation and UMISH show it's actually falling, which is good. And even uh, comprehensive measures like trueflation show inflation's falling. So that hasn't happened, but that would be the, the whole world's in trouble if we have inflation, because then you need something that is inflation resistant as the only way to be protected. Well, Bitcoin doesn't fix that, does it, Tom? No, I'm just kidding on that because we don't even talk. Space rocks. We, yeah, space rocks, exactly. Well, listen, Tom, again, we really appreciate you coming on. We really appreciate you articulating your bullish thesis. Guy started this conversation by saying that we've had a view. A lot of our listeners had said, hey, listen, we really love to hear Tom articulate kind of why we could be wrong. And again, we tend to be a bit more tactical. And I know that the work that you're doing is a bit more thoughtful as you're speaking to clients of Fundstrat and FS Insights. So we appreciate you coming on on the tape and articulating your views and hope to have you back really soon. So thanks a lot, Tom. Yeah, take care, guys. What's up? Guy here. Did you know FactSet is the official data provider for risk reversal media? FactSet is the key to all of our analysis. It's not just charts. FactSet provides insight into the top headlines of the day, private markets, and sector-specific data. If you ever have issues, get help from their support team that is committed to your success. Visit FactSet.com to experience the power of FactSet 
and request a free trial and unlock access to the tools that matter most to you. Well, welcome back to the On The Tape Podcast. Viewer questions. I love this part. See, we're trying to morph. We listen to you folks, and we're trying to grow into the podcast that you want us to be. So we got some viewer questions. This is from Jim Keefe, double E, not I-E-F. Be curious how you guys think the yield curve inversion, particularly the 210, will resolve itself, if it will, both on an absolute and relative basis. How do you see it playing out with the push-pull of different factors? Danny Moses, thank you. So two-year is really tied more to kind of what the Fed is doing. So whatever the Fed does, I think that's the direction there. The 10-year, in my opinion, is longer-term inflation and economic activity. I think we are, quote, re-entering the stagflationary environment, which is why we're seeing the 210 spread here, inversion approach 100 basis points. I think we will get there. I think it resolves itself, obviously, the first hint that the Fed is done raising and or will be cutting at some point later this year or early next, coinciding that with longer term inflation staying steady around a lower level than that. And if we don't get a complete collapse in the economy, the inversion will start to flatten and we will get back towards a flat. And then over a period of time, when things finally correct themselves and the S&P is at 3,200 and the Fed is imminently cutting and we survive it, then I think we have a steepening curve over a period of time. So as volatile as the yields have been in the bond market here, which is crazy, I know Guy opines on it all the time, we will probably have one of these 200 basis point quick shift in the two year as soon as the realization occurs that the Fed may be done and or indeed cut. Would not be shocking to see a 5% move to a 3.5% in a straight line. I mean, literally over a very short period of time, that's probably when the curve stops inverting and eventually the 10 year will catch up with that if the economy is gonna slow, but I would not be shocked to see that. So maybe in mid threes areas where we kind of see the flattening start to occur. Yeah, and I will tell you, it will resolve itself, but it won't be a pretty resolution of such. I mean, something's gonna break along the way. And I've said, and Danny, you know this, Dan, you know this as well. I thought we're going to go to 1% inversion for quite some time. And here we are seemingly on the precipice of that. The Fed controls a lot of things. They clearly don't control the yield curve, although there are central banks out there that are trying to do exactly that. It's actually called yield curve control. Now, if we go down that route, we got bigger problems. And Danny, I will tell you, in my opinion, and I'm not trying to tee you up here, but I will. This all leads to the gold market. By the way, central banks in 2022 bought $70 billion worth of gold with a B, record amount in terms of dollars. It's also a record amount in terms of ounces. It's all setting up for the gold market, which hasn't manifested itself in the price yet to start to go to the upside, Danny. Uh, Danny, just hold on to your seat here. So the other day, Guy and Carter and I were doing a market call. That's MRKT call. And Carter had a bullish take on gold, especially relative to the SBX. And Guy is obviously playing for a move back towards those highs from about a month ago. I actually put on a call spread what? in April, targeting in the GLD, Danny boy. Whoa! You know what it is? And I've said this to you before in the past. I look Look for ways to express views using options that look cheap to me, especially relative to what I think is likely to happen. And again, this is kind of a bearish play if you think about it, being bullish on gold right here. But that was my take. And I'll just say this. Carter and I also did a 43-year log chart of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, okay, going back to 1980. And when you look at that and you look at the fact that it's literally just picked its head up above that 43 year downtrend. I mean, you get to four and a quarter, Danny, at some point. And I think to your point about what the Fed is doing with the short end, sooner or later, they will be cutting because if it does push us into a kind of stagflation goes into recession sort of environment, then the 10 year is going to start coming down to reflect that. And a check back to that downtrend makes a whole heck of a lot of sense in my opinion. So I think playing for much higher yield in the 10 year is probably not a great trade right here. And let's see how it acts when it gets back towards those highs that we were hit in October in and around, I think it was like 430 or something. Great to have you on board for the gold trade. I think I will tell you that in the last few days, gold, something has happened here where it's actually starting to work or at least not get hit in a very inflationary kind of environment. So there's a little sea change going on here. We kind of rebounded from 1810 back to the 1850 level, and it seems like it's holding here. So very interesting time period right here in gold may indeed be an inflection point.
The next is from Peter. Love the way he spells his name. He must be like a Swedish hockey player or something. P-T-O-R. Peter says, very much enjoy your show, guys. Thank you. Guy, meaning me, repeatedly says the Bank of Japan is flailing as they let JGB rates slide up. Why is that? The yen is appreciated since the policy shift, and that's what they wanted after U.S. yen got above 145. The bet now is they will tweak a little more before the new Bank of Japan governor takes over, which should reverse recent yen weakness. Why beat up the Bank of Japan? I'm not beating them up. What I'm trying to illustrate is I think they've really lost control not only of their currency, but of their bond market. Yeah, they put some Band-Aids on it. They got some quick fixes. They intervened in their currency for the first time in a long time, I think six or so months ago. They effectively did the same thing in terms of the currency with their yield controls a few months ago. But I think it's just a matter of time. They can stop the bleeding for a period of time, but this is a patient that's in the triage. And if you watch MASH, which, by the way, celebrated its 40th year from their final episode. It's one of those things like not a lot we can do for the patient at this point. Let's move on to somebody that has a shot. And I don't think, I mean, this is just my opinion, Danny. I think the Bank of Japan's on a bit of life support here. So different, Peter. I put a thread out late last week on Japan and Bank of Japan, and I talked to Peter Bookvar as I was doing it because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't crazy. And his comment to me was, which I agree, is if you have a repatriation back into Japan, it may actually may be a positive for the Japanese equity market over time. But I highlighted the fact that they own over a trillion dollars worth of our treasuries, they're the largest foreign owner of our treasuries. And I think that is adding fuel to the fire here and our 10-year yields moving higher. And I think people need to be aware of that. I agree with you, Guy, what they're doing. I mean, a couple billion dollars here or there to try to stem the tide. Their inflation is running hot, yet their 10-year yields are at 0.5%. So structurally, they're going to have a problem. And my thing is to try to figure out how does it impact us over here? And I believe they'll continue to be sellers of our treasuries. Yeah, and I think you're right in pointing out it's probably has been impacting us. We just don't talk about it. But right before our very eyes, which, as I mentioned before, is a shitty Chicago song, we're seeing the moves in our bond market. So sort of is what it is. And I'm not beating up the Bank of Japan. I'm sure they're lovely. But I also think that they realize that they have a problem. They've tried to quell that problem, to your point, Danny, with sort of Band-Aids here and there. But it's a structural thing. that I think at the end of the day, it's going to be out of their control. We'll see how it shakes itself out. All right, peeps, we covered a lot of ground here, and I hope you guys all appreciate we're trying to work some different things in there. So keep the comments coming to us on email. You can hit us at contact at risk reversal. You can tweet at any of us or at on the tape pod. And obviously, if you like what you're hearing, leave a review in the podcast or in your favorite podcast store. So thanks a lot. We'll see you all next week. Smash the like button. Thanks once again to CME Group, iConnections, and SoFi for sponsoring this episode of On the Tape. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find the show, and we love hearing from you. You can also email us at contact at riskreversal.com. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at OnTheTapePod. On the Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. Mm-hmm.